Um, today's talk is by Professor Jonas Bunt from Bunta. Yeah, okay. That's right. From uh, the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, he's an assistant professor there in public policy and political economy, um, doing interesting research on finance, um, violence, um, how governments obtain and spend money. And even though he's a very young scholar, he's already fast out of the gates with publications in ISQ, Journal of Peace Research and World Development. Um, today he'll be talking about guns and money, also known as interdependencies between military and financial cooperation. <laughs> Let's open up. Welcome. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. It's truly a pleasure, a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, this is, uh, so I'm going to present joint work with uh, Brandon Kinney, a friend of mine um, uh, from, uh, from Dallas, actually. And um, I, I'm aware that the, the, the event is going to be live streamed. So uh, the only prior knowledge to live streaming that I have is that whenever I hear something about live streamed events, someone is getting shot. So I very much hope that that's not the case here, and that's why I took out guns and money from the title. Um, OK. So, I'm interested, or well, I study bilateral loans, and I study sovereign borrowing, if you will, or um, yeah, government to government loans. So I thought that it might make sense to just at the very beginning um, use some time to just clarify some things about bilateral loans, right? So they're, they're government to government transfers with the expectations for payment. And they are different, but not quite different, from foreign aid. So ODA, Official Development Assistance, is kind of like the um, uh, the, it's a catchphrase for all kinds of different um, government activities that are um, directed at, at developing countries, right? So if I give a grant, so cash, without the expectation of work payment, that counts towards my ODA numbers. If I um, uh, ship some um, rice or corn or mice or something to a developing country, the monetary equivalent of that gets um, credited towards my ODA. If even some um, expenditures um, within the, the donor country, so refugee resettlements or administrative costs count towards ODA, and some bilateral loans do as well if they are cheap enough. So very cheap loans do count as ODA, but most of them don't because they are more expensive than that. So there's a difference between bilateral loans and, and foreign aid. Uh, I study bilateral loans. I, I might be biased because it's my research, right? So you might disagree with that, but I think they're important. And they're important for several reasons. For one, in terms of the number of actors involved in that activity. Um, my data set uh, includes um, 184 countries, and of these 184 countries, 104 are creditors. They have given loans to other countries. So it's not the case that it's only very like a small number of rich countries that are creditors, but rather um, the, the credit or the lending activities are actually fairly widespread. Similarly, like it's not just uh, uh, like sub-Saharan African countries that are, that are borrowers, but rather, again, here's a relatively large set of countries that do borrow these government-to-government -government loans. In terms of the frequency, um, there are quite a number of bilateral loans. So these are the total number of bilateral loans um, between 1990 and 2013, which is the period for which I have data. Um, and we see that... Um, Bilateral loans are quite frequent in comparison to either multilateral or private loans. Now keep in mind, private loans are still, in terms of volume, larger than bilateral or multilateral loans, but bilateral loans are also, in terms of volumes, larger than multilateral loans. We know a lot about private lending and politics, like Mike Toms and all this kind of work. We know a lot about multilateral loans, lending by the IMF and the World Bank, but bilateral lending, government-to-government -government lending, is, I think, an area that's really interesting and that I invite you to join me in that effort to, to study that. So, um, so what I do is I, I have a book under review that kind of tries to figure out how developing countries choose amongst different lenders. Um, I argue that there is a demand side to it, that it's not just all decided by the creditors, who gets money, who doesn't get money. Um, I have a second paper with Brandon that kind of looks at the power dynamics within the lending, like how do governments use loans in order to gain influence. And then I'm looking at, I have different papers that look at spillovers of bilateral loans into other like areas. One of them, for example, examines whether or not uh, debt relief, whether or not creditors free write on debt relief given by other creditors kind of thing. Um, there's the question of whether or not bilateral loans, government to government loans kind of are door openers for subsequent private investment by companies from the donor countries. 
I investigate that. And then the paper that I'm going to present today is the one whether or not bilateral loans and security cooperation are actually related. So I will focus on that only. And our motivating, motivating example is the following. Right? So in 2009, um, the Kyrgyz government uh, vote, vote, uh, took a vote and forced um, the U.S. forces that were stationed there um, to abandon the Manas air base that they were, very, they were able to use uh, in the previous couple of years. At the same time, Russia, which also used an air base about 50 kilometers away from Manas, the air base is called Kant, um, Russia was allowed to keep that air base. Uh, and even the, the, the lease was renewed. Um, and the question is, like, what explains why Kyrgyzstan kicked out the US and maintained uh, relationships with Russia? Now, some commentators said uh, that was obviously something that stirred up some news. And we, like, you can find quite a number of newspaper articles. And almost, uh, like, almost without exceptions, um, they mentioned the fact that just prior to that vote by the Kyrgyz government, the Kyrgyz government received a loan offer of $2 billion from Russia. And in addition, um, Russia has lent to Kyrgyzstan on multiple occasions in the past, whereas the US had never lent to Kyrgyzstan. Okay. Uh, many people suggested that there might be a relationship between those two things, right? That these loans kind of allowed the Kyrgyz government to rationalize keeping the Russians around but keeping the US out. So our question is really how are financial and military cooperation related? Is it one of those things where you first get a loan and then you cooperate in terms of um, you kind of build up the capacity so that the partner is a, a good military partner later on, a security partner? Or is it the other way around where kind of loans are given as a reward for prior cooperation in terms of security? Which, or is it both? Like, so we would like to, to investigate that further. Obviously, um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here, right? Like we're, we're not the first ones to look into financial cooperation or financial relations and security relations between countries. Um, and probably the, the first kind of starting point for uh, examining what work is already out there is the commercial peace theory, which argues that economic interdependence reduces conflict. It provides signaling, it provides like uh, alternative um, kind of uh, forums for conflict resolution and things like that. So um, quite a number of people have argued that like increased trade between two countries uh, reduces um, uh, conflict because of increased opportunity costs, for example. Also increased FTI between two countries reduces conflict um, for very much the same reasons. The problem though is that if we're looking at like security cooperation between countries, the, the absence of conflict is, might not be a good proxy for cooperation, right? Because the absence might be the absence of conflict might be the result of either a deliberate policy choice or um, a result of uh, uh, like ignoring the country. So a, a better starting point might be that uh, large literature again, but somewhat more narrowly defined on trade and formal alliances, right? And starting with Goa and Mansfield and many others, including here in this room, um, have argued that trade and alliances are actually very much linked, right? That alliances increase trade, the trade in turn also increase alliances uh, or make them more likely. Some people have disagreed with that, but there is somewhat of a consensus that um, alliances and trade are somehow related, even though we don't know quite precisely how and some details are, are, um, are maybe uh, not quite as um, clear-cut as we would like. <clears throat> so if trade and formal alliances are related, then this would be the starting point for us to figure out whether or not security cooperation more broadly and uh, bilateral loans are related. Right? And so as we were examining the existing kind of work, we, we kind of saw three things where we would like to um, would like to expand upon what we already know, right? And these three kind of problems are uh, comparisons between apples and oranges, are um, difficulties of measuring security cooperation, and issues of energy need. Let me talk about each of these three things in turn. So the existing literature assumes that uh, trade reduces or leads to alliances or reduces conflict uh, because they are 
they are actors, private individuals, that have something to lose. If they were war, right, um, their livelihood, their economic livelihood, their ability to trade with another country would, would disappear. So therefore, they have an incentive to lobby their government in order to make sure that the, those two governments don't go to war or cooperate in some kind of way. So in other words, trade and, or FDI, depending on which variable you want to look at, are private activities. However, security cooperation is a, is a public activity. It's something that governments decide. So this literature on, on trade and alliances has to use micro-assumptions um, about interest groups and lobbying and collective actions. Like the people affected or that would bear these opportunity costs of if a war should start, right? These people, these individuals, these private traders would have to get together, would have to lobby, the government would have to listen, and then would have to implement it. All of these things have to be in order, in, uh, or have to be in place in order for that link between trade and alliances to occur. Now, that's perfectly fine, that might very well happen. But we are trying to circumvent making these assumptions by using an explicitly public measure of economic interdependence, which is, or which are these government-to-government -government loans that, that I'm interested in, right? Because after all, these are used for strategic purposes just as security corporations used for strategic purposes. So we would be comparing apples to apples as opposed to apples to oranges by looking at two activities in the economic and the security realm that are both essentially private activities, sorry, essentially public activities, okay? Secondly, measuring security cooperation um, is often done, or is almost exclusively done, um, by looking at formal alliances. So things like the NATO, uh, things like um, explicit kind of um, alliances where if I get attacked, you will help me, and if you get attacked, I will help you, right? um, And despite what the current environment, political environment here in this country might say, I would think that many would agree that formal alliances are still very much important. <laughs> um, however, non-traditional threats like cross-border terrorism, like uh, piracy, like cyber war, things like that are on the rise, are becoming increasingly common and are like formal alliances are not well equipped to deal with these kind of threats, right? So one example might be France. Um, we looked through um, some of the, the WikiLeaks cables, for example, in order to figure out what people or what governments actually thought about the, um, like the, the use of formal alliances or the usefulness of formal alliances with respect to these non-traditional threats. And, um, there's this explicit statement by a French advisor saying that essentially all our formal alliances with African governments are kind of obsolete. Um, if the quote is, if France is attacked, are we really going to expect, or much less rely on, that Togo will go to war with us? Probably not, right? And actually, vice versa, on the, the African side, right, uh, the, the army chief of the Comoros um, is, is um, uh, quoted with saying that these defense treaties are actually um, kind of outdated for the kinds of security challenges that they primarily face today, right? It should be um, like scrapped in favor of something else, right? And so this something else is what we want to do. So Brandon did a, a, a lot of work coding these so-called defense cooperation agreements, DCAs. And we're going to use these defense cooperation agreements, these DCAs, instead of formal alliances. Now, what are these DCAs? Right? They um, are probably best illustrated by the fact sheet of the DCA that the US government has published with respect to the DCA that they signed with Brazil, which says that the DCA between the US and Brazil promotes cooperation in research, development, logistic support, technology security, the acquisition of defense products, information exchanges, combined military training, education, military exercises, exchanges, and so on and so forth. So these DCAs are not formal alliances where um, there's kind of a mutual defense commitment, but rather they capture the kind of day-to-day -day kind of activities that countries engage in, in in order to cooperate in terms of security. So they are a much more, like they capture a much more managerial approach to security than formal alliances. Again, that's not to say that formal alliances aren't important, but they're, we're capturing something else. We're capturing the day-to-day -day cooperation between countries. 
And so the correlation between alliances and DCAs is actually really low, precisely because these kinds of cooperations occur between the partners that we typically don't consider to be partners in terms of security. So there are DCAs between Indonesia and Turkey, between South Africa and Liberia, um, and a whole bunch of others, hence the low correlation. So, the third issue is endogeneity. We're not the first ones to point that out. There's a lot of literature trying to figure out how trade leads to alliances and how alliances leads to trade. Like, it's widely recognized that there is a two-way relationship going on. However, in addition to this endogeneity across networks, we argue that there are actually other endogenous influences that we should account for, right? The one is not only endogeneity across networks, like trade to alliances and alliances to trade, or in my case, DCAs to loans and loans to DCAs, but also endogeneity within these networks. So, an example. Um, Dominica, a tiny country, Latin America, right, wanted to get a loan from Taiwan in 2004 or 5, I think. Um, requested about $60 million, um, uh, but didn't really say what they wanted to use it for, right? Um, so Taiwan said no. Dominica said fine, turned around, went to China. Asked them for a loan, China was more than happy to provide it. So, in a dyadic research design, we would examine whether or not Taiwan, sorry, whether or not uh, Dominica would get a loan from Taiwan while ignoring that China even exists. Whereas that's clearly not what we want to do, right? Clearly, China plays a role in that relationship, right? So in other words, the lending of one country, or the gov like government's behavior, like condition their lending behavior on the lending behavior of other governments. In other words, existing loans influence potential future. So the, the loans are endogenous to themselves. So there's an endogeneity within the lending network that we should take account of. Right? The same obviously occurs within the security corporation network. Right? If uh, you, the Ukraine negotiates with the US, it doesn't do so in a, in a vacuum. Right? It clearly considers Russia and other players as well. So if governments condition their ties on the, on the behavior of, of other governments, that endogeneity is where politics happens. In a sense. That's what we want to model and actually figure out. Secondly, we argue that there's not only endogeneity within diets, diets is probably the wrong word, but where, like we argue that there might be higher order effects where it's not only about, hey, if you have a trade agreement, if you, have, if you trade with me, then um, I have an alliance with you, and if you have an alliance with, you, with me, then I will fight with you, but rather that there are things like my position in the loan network affecting security cooperation or higher, like, third-order effects where um, my dealings with third parties affect my dealings with you. So our approach is that endogeneity of this sort is not a nuisance, but rather this is what's substantively interesting. I don't want to instrument that away, but rather I want to model it explicitly because that's, at least in my opinion, where the interesting things happen. Right? So I, and sorry, I am Brendan, me and Brendan, uh, we want to co-evolute, we want to model this co-evolution um, of security and lending over time and figure out how energy within both networks and across both networks actually interact. The starting point for our theory is that there, is, there are going to be, or we'll hypothesize that there are like, direct effects, positional effects, and informational effects. So direct effects where loans affect DCAs and DCAs affect loans. Then secondly, positional effects, where the position in the loan network affects the likelihood of the DCA, and vice versa. And then informational effects, where the loan relationship with third parties affects the likelihood of the DCA, and vice versa. So I'll go through each of these things in turn. We argue that, so, okay, we argue that a bilateral loan between two countries, I and J, increases the likelihood of a DCA between those two countries. So note here on this graph, there are three dimensions. There's color, type, and uh, width, right? So uh, um, how do you say straight lines? Like uh, solid lines are like existing relationships, whereas dotted lines are potential relationships. Red are loans, and black are um, DCAs. And uh, the width is the likelihood that 
such a relationship, that such a potential relationship will occur. So if a loan exists, we argue that a DCA is going to be more likely than if no loan exists. Now, why is that the case? There are two ways in which we can think about this. First, loans might be what, uh, what people call side payments. So a payment without like an explicit quid pro, pro quo. I think Mike, Miles Caller um, argues that the side payments are given in order to transform the preferences of the recipient in the long run without expecting an immediate like, um, uh, action in return. Right? So a relate, one, possible, one example of that would be the relationship between India and Japan. Right? So in this cable from the US Embassy in Japan back to the State Department in, in the US, they say that, hey, there was this meeting between India and Japan where the security relationship between the two countries will be discussed, but only kind of in general terms. The purpose of the talks will be to confirm that India and Japan share the same intentions with regard to naval and other military cooperation. And by the way, we'll sign a, a, a $5 billion loan um, to help uh, uh, things in, in India. Right? So that would be an example of a side payment where there's no explicit linking of the loan and the security corporation components of the talks, but where there's very much a kind of the suggestion, hey, if Japan gives a loan to India, then maybe India is going to be more amenable in the future for more security corporation. Let's, let's figure that out. On the other hand, we can also think about like explicit issue linkage, right? Where uh, these, like a package deal is negotiated, if you will, right? Where um, I like, cooperate with you in terms of security only if you give me some monetary compensation. So an example would be uh, the negotiations that um, Turkey and the US engaged in uh, in 2003, like just, um, just as the, the conflict in Iraq uh, was like, kind of imminently um, hap like imminent, um, there were examples or that we were able to find in primary documents of both um, like bargaining <coughs> linkage and enforcement linkage, right? So bargaining linkage where this facility, the loan facility, um, was argued to help the Republic of Turkey to maintain confidence, support the Turkish economy, and kind of offset the economic impacts of this conflict that was going to happen. And then at the same time, the, loan, the text of the proposed loan agreement, it wasn't actually signed, but the proposed loan agreement, uh, very much said that, hey, if Turkey doesn't hold up its end of the bargain, we will pull the funding. So both side payments, as well as issue linkage, would result in the fact that a bilateral loan would increase the probability of a DCA. We also argue that the opposite is the case, where the existence of a DCA between two countries would make a loan more likely. Again, two reasons for why that might be the case. First, um, you might want to increase the security capacities of allies. Um, so um, there are examples of that, of, uh, for example, China and uh, Tajikistan, where um, Tajikistan received a loan as they were trying to figure out how to make Tajikistan a more effective security partner, and issue linkage again, but now with the causality reversed. Now, in the sense, uh, the, the uh, security corporation comes first and the loan comes second. So an example would be China and Russia, right? So where China, according to this cable from the US Embassy in China, said that China was not completely satisfied with uh, the recent loan for oil agreement with Russia. However, Young noted that the military support for the deal had weighted heavily in the central government's decision to go forward. So this would again be, uh, this, these would be two examples for why we would expect that DCAs would lead to loans. Okay, so far I've only talked about kind of like bilateral relationships between one country and another. Let me now talk about the, the really networky part of this, of, uh, of our hypothesis, right? Um, where we examine the position of a country in the lending network and how that position affects the likelihood of the DCA. Okay. So here we argue that very active creditors, so creditors that provide a lot of loans to other third parties K, are less likely to be sought out as the security partners than countries that don't have a lot of existing lending relationships. And the, our reasoning kind of echoes Aristotle saying that a friend to all is a friend to none, right? People like creditors that kind of 
kind of blend indiscriminately for, for kind of everyone, right, uh, might exhibit diffuse political commitments and are not necessarily trustworthy partners that I want to, to uh, share sensitive information with, right? So therefore, we argue that countries that are highly active creditors in the loan network are less attractive as potential security partners. <coughs> The reverse, let's now look at the reverse, so the, the position in the security network and whether or not that affects the likelihood of a loan. We argue that uh, countries that are very active in the, in the DCA network that have lots of security corporations with others are less likely to receive loans than others. And the reason is simple. If I have fewer existing security corporations, I might be, like, as a creditor, I might be more willing to give a loan to that country because there's a higher chance for me to actually influence that country. So an example would be at the relationship between the U.S. and Thailand. Right? So this cable suggests that Thailand remains a vital military ally, uh, only one of uh, five in the East Asian and Pacific region, precisely because Thailand has not signed an agreement with China and others. Right? But rather, it has relatively few DCAs, and one of them is with the United States. So therefore, I am going to, uh, or like the, uh, the, I think it was the ambassador that, um, asked um, President, um, Secretary of State Clinton at the time, no, that's not true, who was it? Secretary of State at the time, sorry, uh, to, to talk with the, China, with, the China, Thai, with the Thai authorities in order to press for deeper um, economic integration, given that they already have a security situation. So, long story short, we argue that countries that are highly active in the DCA network are most likely unwilling to accept loans and um, uh, or at least like give in to political demands if they accept loans. Now, the third types of attacks are these informational attacks where um, my relationship with a third party informs my likelihood uh, to, to do something. So we argue that a similar loan portfolio, for example, uh, between two countries, so in this case I and JI, J1, um, they both borrow from the same set of creditors, right? And that that kind of signals something that is important. In particular, like countries with similar borrowing portfolio, we argue, are more likely to go on to be uh, ideologically or politically aligned, and th therefore should be more likely to sign DCAs than countries that don't share a borrowing portfolio. The reason is simple, right? A debtor that turns to China and Russia for credit exhibits a different political commitment than a debtor that turns to the US and the UK or Germany for loans. So we argue that these relationships, these lending relationships with third parties provide information that, that is meaningful. Conversely, uh, the relationship of my relationship to my security partners um, also might provide me with, with meaningful information for my lending activities. If I observe my security partners providing loans to one particular uh, country, that uh, gives me probably some indication of uh, whether or not there's a foreign policy alignment between uh, that borrower and my friends, my security friends. So I might as well lend to my security friends as well. Okay. So there's a possibility of developing joint security partners there's the possibility of just following my friend's advisor who is a trustworthy borrower and will return my money. Um, so they're both informational mechanisms that might lead to the same conclusion. That is, creditors prefer to lend to the same debtors as their DCA partners. So these are our six hypotheses that we are trying to test. Um, essentially, these six hypotheses are like trying to operationalize different types of endogenous influences across these networks. Um, we use data from 1995 to 2010 uh, in order to test this. We argue that a, a, a tie between two nodes, a DCA tie between two nodes exists when a DCA has been signed between now and or like in the current year or in the four prior years. Um, the reason why we use this window is quite simple. Uh, we have information on quite a number, sorry, we have information on the duration of DCAs for quite a number of the DCAs, but not all. So some DCAs are last indefinitely, others don't have any um, information on how long they will last. And those that are that have a specific number 
90% of those can do for at least five years. So in a sense, it's likely that DCAs on average will actually last longer than five years, but we want to be conservative and rather err on the, on the side of cost. Similarly, we argue uh, we code a one, i.e. a loan tie, if there has been a loan between I and J in the last five years as well. And here, a similar reason, right? The, the average grace period of these loans, i.e. the time between like, signing the loan and then having to start repaying the monthly or quarterly uh, payments in a sense, that grace period is on average five years. So we would expect that loans might have an effect on the recipient government for longer than five years, but we would expect that as soon as I have to start repaying, that my predisposition to do whatever the creditor wants me to do will decline. So again, we will be conservative here. We use a network approach in order to test our hypothesis. Mm -hmm. right? um, so we use a, a stochastic actor-oriented model, um, which is like, think of like an agent-based model. There are different nodes, different actors in this network. Um, and what we want to do is we want to simulate this network and compare it to the observed network and obviously try to minimize the differences between the simulated and the observed network. Right? So the standard kind of stochastic actor-oriented model um, assumes that these actors, these governments in my case, right, seek to maximize a single utility function. Right? So in creating or terminating these ties, I'm trying to maximize my, my utility. Our extension of this kind of model is to add a second network. So the X network is, say, the DCA network, and the Y network is, say, the loans network, right? And we just, we just um, model like a separate corresponding utility function for this second network loans, and therefore model two utility functions simultaneously. We estimate this. It's different, this is difficult to estimate, right? So we have to, to pursue this by, um, by uh, simulated methods of moments. Um, essentially the same as I just described, right? We, we locate the better, better half parameters that uh, generate the simulated networks or two simulated networks that are as closely related to the observed networks as possible. So what is in these two utility functions? There are three kind of broad types of, of, of factors or variables that we, that we include. Right? Um, the first factor are these cross-network influences that I just tried to hypothesize. So hypotheses one through six are going to be operationalized in, and these respective variables are included in this utility. Secondly, I'm going to include some of the endogenous network, network influences where loans affect loans and DCAs affect DCAs because Dominica didn't do that without looking at China and so forth, right? Um, so we are going to include a couple of um, um, network influences that um, are supposed to capture the within network um, endogeneity, not the across network endogeneity. And then lastly, we're going to inc include a couple of exogenous control variables. So, we operationalize these six hypotheses, uh, first by just including the, the kind of cross product between the two networks for hypotheses one and two. We use the DCA degree and the loan out degree to, um, to capture uh, hypotheses four and three. We use DCA closure um, in order to examine whether or not um, uh, the lending by my trusted partners actually affects my decisions to lend. And then we, uh, uh, we just operationalize the loan similarity of two countries um, and include that as a parameter. I'm going to skip the within network endogeneity terms and focus on the exogenous control variables because it's in, like, in the past, when we've presented this paper, we often get the question, well, but th that's all fine, like all these like endogenous influences, but what about the real hard things that we actually can control for? So I just want to make sure that I tell you exactly what we're controlling for, right? So we are in the DCA equation where we're trying to predict whether or not loans um, predict um, um, 
uh, new DCAs, new security corporations. We are controlling for economic factors such as GDP per capita or total bilateral trade. We are going to control for military power, formal military alliance, NATO member, common enemy, common terrorist threat, and political variables such as regime type and colonial legacies. In the loan equation, we are going to, where we are estimating whether or not uh, DCAs affect new loans in a sense, we control for other things that could affect whether or not a new loan is going to be extended, right? Which are, for example, the credit rating of the recipient, whether or not the recipient is currently in default, the GDP per capita, exports and imports between recipient, and, uh, between creditor and debtor, um, the oil reserves, kind of think about China lending to countries to get access to oil, um, corruption, and then again, formal military alliance, and things like that. So we argue that these endogenous influences should very much persist even after um, controlling for these factors. Before you move, what, the distance between capital cities, what, right. what is that? I mean, I understand what that is, but why, why do you need that? That's an excellent point. The, the argument is that it might be easier to do the security cooperation with, with countries that are close by. So thinking about um, uh, Germany cooperating with uh, uh, probably with Libya more uh, than with South Africa, because the, the flow of refugees, for example, through Libya is, is much more important than the flow of refugees through South Africa. So geographical distance, in a sense, would be negatively related to the likelihood of, of, um, of, of cooperation. These, in a nutshell, are our results. Keep in mind that these are the results that explicitly take into account endogeneity between the, the security and the financial cooperation. So we find that, can I do this? Yeah. So we find, so this on the left panel here, um, this is the equation that tries to predict security cooperation. We want to know whether or not bilateral loans affect the likelihood of new security corporations. We find that if I have a bilateral loan relationship, a DCA is more likely. And we find here on the loan equation that if I have a DCA, a loan is more likely. So these first order effects appear to be very much there. Second order effects were the, these positional effects, where we argued that the, um, the position in the, D, in the loan network, so very active creditors, are less likely to be um, sought out as security partners we find that the coefficient is negatively as negative as predicted, but not statistically significant. So no evidence here. But we do find that very active DCA countries are less likely to receive a loan. In terms of loan similarity, we do find that countries that share the same borrower portfolio are more likely to cooperate in terms of security. And we do find that countries very much observe who their friends are lending to, and that increases the likelihood so these effects are actually substantively important, right? So if there's a loan, then a DCA is 38% more likely. If there's a DCA, then a loan is 42% more likely. That's much larger than the effects for alliances, respectively. We know that loan centrality is insignificant. Um, DCA centrality, whether or not, like the number of DCA partners that I have, makes loans less likely, and that effect is like, not trivial either, and actually compounds non-linearly um, if we add up DCAs. And similarly, the likelihood of a new DCA is very much affected by loan similarity. So per shared credit or more, it's an 18% increase in the likelihood of a DCA. And similarly, the shared DCA partner makes loans significantly more likely. So these are not small, non-trivial effects, but actually sizable. And I think, if you don't mind, I will skip over the model fit, but I'm happy to talk about that later. Concluding remarks. So our findings are such that economic and defense relationships are very much fit, as we would expect from the existing literature already, right? But we do find that these cross-network influences are actually not quite as simple and easy as we first assumed, but rather that there are quite a number of higher order effects that are operating and that the, the magnitude of these effects is actually not, it's non-trivial. 
this research has implications for how we think about the rise of China and India as new creditors. It will have, obviously, economic consequences. We knew that already, right? But it will also have security consequences. That's what we are. And similarly, the proliferation of non-traditional security threats will not only have security consequences, but also economic consequences. That's where I want to start. Thanks so much. I think this is a really interesting paper that develops both conceptual and methodological ideas that are really wide-ranging wide and really useful for a lot of different areas. Um, I think conceptually I really, really liked the idea of defining what cooperation really means. I think there's a tendency in the IR literature to assume that cooperation is any tie between states that doesn't involve people killing each other. Um, anything except war is cooperation. Um, I think that your idea that state behavior needs to be cooperative to really measure what we think we're measuring is really useful. I also appreciate the emphasis on DCAs. Um, I think the traditional view of alliances is really outdated, and you're right that they're useful, but we're no longer really in the world where we're waiting for Germany to attack <laughs> or something like that. Um, you never know. I know, you know. <laughs> See, are you hearing warning? <laughs> yeah. um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think that that modernization is really helpful. Um, I also like this idea of co-evolving networks. I think network analysis has caught on quite a bit in IR, but it still is very much the model of the network of the independent variable affects the network of the dependent variable and not really understanding how those move together. Um, so that's really helpful. I think in terms of the theory itself, it's, it's very interesting, but I think there's a little bit of confusion because there are two very different theoretical stories. Um, we talked a bit about this at lunch, <laughs> but the, the role of time is very, um, very different in the two cases. So it could be that states are forming cooperative arrangements in the defense realm um, or the loan realm, the financial realm. And then that creates this sort of culture of cooperation, this norm that that's what states do. They have friendly ties, they're friends, therefore they will then cooperate in the next area. On the other hand, it could be that states are using these cooperative arrangements very strategically. So they, they're willing to cooperate on loans because they need the cooperation on security or vice versa. Um, but that is a much more immediate time horizon. And I think the setup right now can show whether or not the cooperation happens, but not why. Um, I think there's potential to sort of play around with some of the time horizons in the specification. You talked about trying different, um, different windows to see if you know, the issue is not whether, it has, whether one has occurred in the last five years, but in the last one year or the past 10 years. I think also controlling potentially for um, past arrangements outside of the specified window. So not just was there a DCA or a loan existing in the last five years, but did we have one the five years before that or the five years before that? Um, if you can establish that this is part of a long-term pattern versus a, an immediate incident-driven um, cooperation. It also might be helpful to think about controlling for the presence of security or financial events that would, um, that would trigger these things. So if there, if one of the states in question experiences a significant terror attack or um, some sort of conflict, political violence, something like that, that might be driving these results. And then you could, sh you could use that as evidence that this is more of a strategic story than a culture, cultural story. Um, but beyond that, I think the, um, the setup makes a lot of sense to me. It was, really, it was really nice to read about a new sort of network model that I wasn't familiar with. Um, you didn't talk about the model fit part here, but in the paper, um, there's a very nice sort of comparison with the Logit model, um, which was very compelling, very convincing. I think the only sort of draw, drawback with that is that Logit models have been fairly soundly discredited for any sort of interactive type, um, type of process. So I think it's a fairly easy fight to win. Um, I think it would be interesting to do some sort of goodness of fit assessment that actually assesses the fit compared to other 
stochastic actor-oriented models. So do your simulations match the observed networks? Um, I'm not super familiar with these models, but looking around, it looks like there are some methods out there, at least very recently, that might be available to do something like that. Um, but overall, I think this was a really fascinating paper, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to read it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we, we already kind of talked about it at lunch, so I, I feel I'm cheating because if I were to respond to your comment, should I respond or should I first yeah, take questions? Mm -hmm. well, whatever you prefer. Do you want me to gather a few and um, respond them all? Or? Yeah, let me gather a few because mm -hmm. I would like that very much. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so on the, I, I really like the move of start there and start with what we know about side payments and issue linkage, which is government to government, and the, the economic interdependence stuff thought of in terms of you know, trade and investment flows didn't really seem to be what you're interested in. So anyway, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about that, and I'll throw out a couple other things. One is the, the logic behind the fourth hypothesis, which is uh, which says that um, countries are less likely to loan to countries that have already have a lot of DCAs. I mean, I understood the logic, but it also seems like the, the opposite logic could be compelling. So, for, for two reasons. One is that wouldn't, couldn't there be something about these countries that make them attractive as DCA partners? I mean, there must be a reason why so many other countries have DCAs with them. So maybe there's something intrinsically attractive that would make me want to um, lend to them. And secondly, um, you know, it's true that this means that other countries have already kind of, already influencing this country because they have the DCAs. Yeah. But why wouldn't I want to balance that influence by other countries by having my own relationship? Um, you know, maybe I can only move that country a little bit, but if I can move it in the direction of my interest, then, you know, why not? Um, right. As a relative. Anyway, and then the... Um, Last question or comment, have you thought about your, your uh, measure of loan portfolios? I thought was really interesting as a way to capture similarity of interest. And have you thought about trying to play this up as sort of an alternative in the literature to the alliance portfolios and UN voting scores? That's a great idea. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so maybe I can take your second question first. Um, you're absolutely right. The opposite kind of uh, causal mechanism that you outlined is just as plausible as the one that, that we um, outlined. It comes, what, what we would need to have in order to test this would be some kind of a, a, a measure of the identity of whom I'm actually aligned with, right? So the, the balancing argument only works if the, the let me go back, sorry. Ooh. Where am I? No, here. So if, for example, all my friends are these Ks, right, then I don't need to balance. Whereas if this is China and this is Russia and this is the US and the UK, right, then my, my DCA might actually matter. So you, I think you're onto something. I think what we have to do then on our part in order to, to account for that would really to figure out how to systematically include kind of the identity of these Ks in our analyses. Um, now we're, we're controlling for um, like the, the UN kind of ideological distance of, of ideal points. Um, but you're right, we could try to figure out whether or not to use that ideological distance between I and J, which is all we're doing right now, right? Also to figure out the distance between I and these Ks and whether or not that um, 
would provide substantively interesting um, uh, hypotheses in a sense, because that, that would be easy to implement. We would just have to figure out how we would um, kind of measure the ideological heterogeneity of all the keys of a particular J. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, that's a great idea. Um, in terms of um, um, using the measure of loan portfolios as, as an alternative to like the UN scores or, or other like measures of, of ideological similarity, I like that very much. I will include that in, in the framing of the paper. Thank you. Um, and I will have to think about the apples to apples of how to um, incorporate that. I, I see your point and why we are kind of setting up a straw man that we're then like very easily uh, that we're able to cut very easily in, straight, in a very straightforward manner. Um, strategically, I'm concerned about uh, publishing or trying to publish a paper um, about uh, economic and security interdependence without um, citing the work on alliances and trade. Um, but I will have to think about how to incorporate that otherwise if I start with site payments as opposed to alliances. Just to follow up really quickly. Yeah. The, I mean, site payments are not giving a loan to a country that you want to influence, it's not really economic interdependence, it's, it's much more asymmetrical than that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's giving you leverage over them. Right. It seems, to me, it seems pretty different from economic interdependence mm -hmm. um, as we usually think of it. So I, I'm just worried that, you know, it's going to be kind of a recurring problem for you to frame it in terms of economic interdependence. I see where you're coming from. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sarah, thank you. Thanks. Um, a couple questions following up on the economic disparity point. Um, I was wondering if you capture at all those differences in income. And part of what I was thinking about was the question of who's driving these um, connections. Intuitively, I, I would have my fire would have been that it's the more affluent but you were suggesting as you opened that it's, your research suggests otherwise. But I wondered if there's any way of understanding the initiator of the relationship, because your Dominica example also suggested you know, that they, they try to select a, a creditor, but then the creditor said no. Um, so it, it, it puzzled me because it might relate to both understanding the likelihood of, and I would think that economic disparity would be a necessary Are all notes the same? Uh, loans. loans. Ah, mm -hmm. um, is there any way you could leverage variation among the loans to really say um, a bit more about this? this? These are great questions. Um, and they both kind of relate to what Brandon and I have done in the other paper, which looks at lending networks only, not the cross with like security networks. So, um, um, in, in that other paper, we try to figure out like who's moving first. Like, is it is it the creditor that says, "Hey, I want to give you a loan," or or not, or is it the debtor saying, "Hey, I want a loan," or not? Um, and uh, we find um, that like for different countries, uh, different sequences are are in place, right? So uh, you're absolutely right that uh, um, it is typically the richer countries that tend to lend, and the poorer countries that tend to borrow, right? And that there are very few kind of um, lending relationships amongst rich countries, but very like that the, the, the majority of these lending relationships have some kind of a, uh, a disparity in, in average incomes. Um, uh, but we find in that other paper that there are very different considerations that drive um, decisions by creditors and lenders. So creditors are primarily concerned about um, whether or not that's a trustworthy um, uh, debtor, right? So the, the Mike Tom's kind of um, argument that the difference between the economic capacity to repay and the political will to use resources to repay, that that difference is unobservable, right? And that the network kind of provides information to creditors as to like who is a, is a trustworthy lender, uh, sorry, borrower. And the same then for the, um, for the recipient side, right? They want to have 
they want to borrow from, from countries that are unlikely to interfere in their domestic affairs, for example. Well, how do I know this? I can't because it's unobservable in a sense. So they are going to do, glean information from the network to figure out which of these different creditors they want to seek out. Um, so we, we frame this less of less in terms of like sequencing, kind of like who starts with that conversation, but more in terms of like finding the right partners. It's a two-sided matching problem in a sense. Um, so that's what we do there. Um, we incorporate these here um, with uh, the second types of variables that uh, I didn't really show you, like the um, here, the endogenous network influences where loans affect existing loans affect new loans. So we do control for it, we just don't focus on it substantively because we're already at 12,000 words. Kind of thing. <laughs> um, are all the loans the same? Clearly they're not, right? As I said at the very beginning, some loans are cheap, and others are expensive. Um, some loans are big, others are small. We don't have any information, however, on the, the purpose of these loans. Like where these, was this a loan for uh, buying food, or was this a loan for um, uh, investing in a hydroelectric power plant, or was this a loan to purchase weapons, right? That obviously would, would play into this. We, we just don't have any data on this. Um, so what we can do is to, and we probably should do this in the future, um, to differentiate loans by their size and uh, their price, if you will, right? Um, arguing that um, small, cheap loans are more likely going to be the development kind of loans, and large, expensive loans are more likely going to be the, the commercial kind of loans, the export credits and things like that. Um, and uh, I would have to think through what we would expect there, what the theoretical expectations would be. I would assume that um, development loans are probably more likely to result in these, um, like, uh, like side payment mechanisms than, than the commercial loans. That's, that would be my first inclination, but I would have to think about that more. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I had a question about the data set and purchase selection bias in it. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the example that you gave in the beginning of the talk where there was one country that first tried to get a loan from Taiwan and then had to move to China. But from what I understand, would your data set be able to um, get that first move that the attempts Absolutely, yeah. Um, we're working with observational data. It's really hard to observe things that didn't happen, right? So, um, uh, like instances. So we talked about that at lunch. Um, so, for example, for my for my book, right? I needed to figure out under which conditions countries choose this creditor over that creditor, right? So I needed to find instances of rejected loan offers, which is really hard because there's nothing signed. And secondly, you want to want to admit that you rejected a loan offer, right? Um, um, so you're absolutely right, like there would be somewhat of a selection process going on if I were not able to control for kind of like the, the propensity of Dominica to first reach out to Taiwan and then second to, to China, right? One could argue that by controlling for ideological distance, right, we're, we're trying to get at a proxy that kind of captures the propensity to which like potential creditor I go for first if you're willing to buy that that is a sufficient control, then selection bias wouldn't be an issue. There are good reasons to not buy um, that, and um, but I would be hard pressed to find data on events that didn't happen and include this here. Your, your point is absolutely valid, um, but it will be challenging for me to address empirically. When you were looking through the No, no. I mean, in my uh, in my own uh, in this book manuscript, right? Um, I know, for example, that uh, Ecuador has rejected loan offers from from Brazil and from the United States, right? I know that uh, Colombia has rejected loan offers from China, uh, from China. Um, so these examples exist. Um, it's just primarily qualitative research that is able to get you those. Um, yeah. Thank you, though. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, I was very impressed by all the fireworks, but um, what do you think is the most common 
intuitive finding. The most intuitive finding. Counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. Um, that is a question that I have not had so far. Um, let me go to this, right? So, um, for me personally, one thing that I was surprised by is that um, these effects of DCA centrality, for example, or DCA closure, compound in a non-linear way, right? So that they actually, the effects increase the more DCA partners I have. Um, that was something that I did not expect. I would okay, what, what is that hypothesis again? So, for example, this means, um, this was the hypothesis where I observe who my security partners are lending to. And if I see that many of my security partners are lending to this country, Dominica, say, right, then I'm more likely to lend to Dominica as well, just because that lending that I observe by my security partners to Dominica kind of serves as a stamp of approval, so therefore I'm more likely to lend to Dominica as well. And the argument is here that like, with each like, additional kind of shared security partner that is also lending to Dominica, the likelihood of me lending to Dominica actually increases in a nonlinear way. So if I, if I have a security partner in, say, Brazil that is lending to Dominica, my likelihood of providing a loan to Dominica is increased by 14%, whereas if it's not only Brazil, but also my partners, um, I don't know, Mozambique and uh, South Korea that are also lending to Dominica, then my likelihood to lend to Dominica actually increases not by three times 14, but by 40, like by, by a little bit more than that, by 49%. So these nonlinear effects were something that I didn't, like I was expecting kind of like diminishing returns at some point as opposed to increasing returns. <coughs> this is some, which is something that I, um, because what was your underlying story? The underlying story was that, um, yeah, this the stamp of approval. I see that my security partners trust this country, Dominica, with loans, so therefore I will give loans as well. And I expected there to be diminishing returns. Like at some point, like an additional security partner also lending to Dominica it doesn't matter. Whereas apparently that's not the case. I have difficulty choosing between the two. It's not clear, right? Which way you should go? I mean, why were you so... Why was I surprised? Yes, I mean, I was, yeah. I understand you get a different purpose. Right. What, the underlying story behind it, why is it so important? Why, why is the difference so important? Well, I was thinking, and again, I'm just speculating here, right? Um, I was thinking that if I know that Dominica has received a stamp of approval by five of my partners, it would give me enough information about whether or not I want to give a loan. And so that adding a sixth security partner that also lends to Dominica doesn't really give me that much more information if I already have observed five of my partners. Um, so what would be a kind of hypothesis other than information? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, information is Information works for markets, but when it comes to governments, uh, it's a bit of a stretch, right? So, what about uh, strategic interests? Uh, you know, if I happen, I happen to give loans to my strategic friends because I know that I can, if anything goes wrong, I'm more likely to pull my, you know, my money out of the country. That's absolutely a possibility. It comes back to the point earlier where we really would need to like incorporate the identity of these different nodes as opposed to just their monadic characteristics. No, no, but here, no, no, here you know that you're, you're part of a network and you're lending to people, to countries that are, that are part of that security network, right? So you already know they're part of your network. Right. Okay, so that's, you don't need the identity. But then I don't understand how um, it might matter that they are my strategic friends or not strategic friends, because they are all my friends. And for some reason, they have been strategically important enough for me to like, extend a security relationship. No, but they are the friends of your, they are the, they are the strategic friends of your friends. 
Yeah, I would have to think about this more because, in a sense, right now, I think I, I, I think I get what you're getting at. What we are doing right now is exactly what I said we wouldn't be doing with the endogenesis. We're just controlling for it. We're controlling for like ideological entrance, common enemy, common terrorist threat, uh, whether or not they are formal alliances. So these kind of things should capture whether or not a particular country pair. Um, are likely to be or are prone to be strategic allies in a sense, right? Um, so in a sense, my cop-out response, if you will, to you would be, we control all of this, so therefore we don't have to worry about it. Um, but you're probably right that we have to think about this more carefully and figure out what, um, uh, yeah, how, how to incorporate this, hey, you're my strategic friend, I will lend to you no matter what because you're from my friend, irrespective of the information that I get from third parties. How to incorporate that into our theory? Because that's what I think you're getting at. Is that correct? Well, I'm not worried to any position. What I'm saying is that you do a very good job at finding the relations where there should be relations. Because it's so complicated by network stuff, so it's good actually to, to, to prove that that stuff makes sense. I mean, not only it makes sense, mm -hmm that there's a connection between, not interdependence, I totally agree with uh, Alex's reaction. It's the use basically of, of, of both strategic and, uh, and economic uh, tools simultaneously. But to, to prove it empirically is very difficult, right? right. And so, because not, none of the observations are, you know, I mean, are they all related? Right? So you got to control for so much, so much uh, endogeneity. So I think you do a very good job at that. What I'm worried about, we're well, not worried, but I'm saying that the, uh, it is a substantive part, which... Right. So in a sense The substantive part is not setting the paper. Let's put it this way. Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. Like, there might be very different kind of mechanisms drive underlying the very same relationships that I find in the data, right? So, in a sense, my hypotheses are suggestions as to, like, what could be driving effects that we indeed in the then later on find. It's kind of like a problem inherent to any statistical analysis in a sense, right? We find a statistical, a statistically significant relationship between two variables. The question is, like, what is the causal mechanism actually? Um, so we don't have a good identification strategy in that sense because in this kind of setting, primarily when we talk about IR stuff, like international relationships, it's really hard to find conditions of a natural experiment that could help us out identifying the precise cause of mechanism. More than so, that, it would be nice to have competing theories. But what about competing theories that both have the same observable implication? No, that's okay, but then, then it's your job to find different observable implications. And you do not start with competing theories. So you first criticize me for not having alternative explanations and then criticize me for not testing these alternative explanations. Well, uh, <laughs> to have a substantive story, you need that competing theory, right? I mean, that's the way. No, yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not being, I'm being. No, no, I know that you want to push me to become better. That's absolutely, that's I'm great. I love this conversation. I just, like, honestly, I, I have. I'm at a loss as to like how to do this um, right now. Maybe we can take another question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I very much like your presentation, and I really like the uh, comments that were given. I'd, li I'd like to get back to one of those, even though you guys have already talked about it. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm um, sorry. Yes. <laughs> perhaps most people here haven't heard your response, and I I'm particularly interested. You went back just five years. What about the previous five? The previous five. Then? Right. I don't know. I should say, um, and, and, and is it, does a history of, of a relationship seem to kind of right. have, a, have a strong right. impact? Yeah. That's a, that both of those are very good questions, right? Um, so my response to Aisha was the following, right? Um, we, we played around with that window that we, um, in order to figure out what would be the, the, the kind of most reasonable 
um, um, uh, empirical strategy, right? So we looked at whether it like 10 years, five years, and three years, right? So whether or not there was a loan or disabled in the last 10 years or five years or three years. And uh, we essentially find the same results, right? Um, what we did not do so far, and that's probably what Aisha's point is, we didn't look at like differential windows, like whether or not like loans have an effect for five years and DCA is only for three years, right? Um, um, because that didn't seem to be intuitive for us initially, right? Um, my sense is that um, my sense is that it doesn't quite matter what kind of precise cutoff we use to define when a tie exists and when it, does, it doesn't exist, for two reasons. Like one, uh, for one, like empirically, like whatever window we use, we, f we get the same results. So, so that would be kind of like a, a cop-out answer again. And secondly, um, the, um, you might remember that when I talked about how we defined whether or not a tie exists, that uh, most of the DCAs um, are longer than five years. Um, uh, some of them are even indefinite, explicitly indefinite, and for a subset of, country, of DCAs, we don't have any information as to like, if they're indefinite or if there's a cutoff point at some point, right? So, um, s considering that we are only looking at 15 years of data between 1995 and 2010, right? It's going to be hard for us to kind of incorporate even longer time horizons, kind of figuring out whether or not prior to those five years windows that we're looking at right now, other DCAs have been signed before, um, because we, we typically have to assume that our five-year window is already conservative because 90% of all DCAs for which we do have data actually do last longer than five years. Um, that would be my response. Does that make sense? Yeah. Excellent. I will ask one. Yeah. So you're asking me what type of transfer a recipient country would prefer, uh, given a certain situation from a certain part? Which, which one is good for the uh, supporting country, for the source country, for the uh, in this situation? For the yes, in a, for uh, for the against the ISIS in this situation, uh, America, U.S. sending the uh, money to Turkey, sends the money to Turkey, and sending. So essentially you're asking me, given that like Turkey faces a terrorist threat, what is the most Turkey meaningful, can, Turkey can, can what is the most tools. meaningful kind of transfer that the US can give to Turkey in order to deal with that threat? Yeah. That's only Turkey, but also the US. That was just an example, right? That's a very good question. It's different paper in a sense, right? Because now I would be differentiating kind of what, what Sarah indicated, right? Different types of transfers, not even different types of loans, but like you mentioned, ammunition versus money. And, um, that is something that, honestly, I, I cannot answer right now because I haven't studied it. For profit, for profit, profit the one, I think they're sending the uh, ammunition, not the money. You don't know where the money goes. It kind of depends on what you want yeah. to accomplish, right? So, uh, thank you, Ben. Thanks. Well, I just want to come back to uh, the issue that Danielle raised, and I think I've, so, for most
of the paper, there is kind of an overarching theoretical point, which is something like, you know, um, this lending behavior um, is as a strategic goal, and the goal is to sort of influence other countries in the security realm, something like that. Um, and that works pretty well until you get to hypothesis five. And I think that's really where the because hypothesis five and six are about information. Right. And by hypothesis six, it's almost purely about how credit worthy is the country. The information is on how reliable they are, and am I, I going to get paid back? So that's starting to drift from the overall point. And in fact, it almost seems to contradict it, because it makes it seem like the behavior isn't sort of strategic security behavior. It's just old fashioned, are you credit worthy or not? Which sort of contradicts the story you're telling. And one through four. So does that sound right, Daniel? There's like a drop off, I think, with hypothesis five and six, where to, to, I think we need a broader theoretical framework in order to easily include those. Otherwise, it's sort of like, here's some interesting hypotheses I can test with this, right. with these data and this yeah. network setup. I think that that is right. Like, in a sense, we would have to work more <coughs> about showing mm -hmm. why loan similarity actually is a measure of ideological or security alignment. Right? And only once we've shown that, then we can say, okay, if there's indeed like this kind of boring portfolio effect that we find, then that is that is driven not only by like information considerations, but by strategic security considerations, right? uh, considerations. So we would have really have to do a better job than I just did here in this presentation to show that um, if countries borrow from the same set of creditors, that, that says something very important security relationships that is otherwise not observable. Um, you're absolutely right. You should, you should do a better job. Does that make you happier too? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally happy. <laughs> <laughs> He's just been thinking about that Togo alliance this whole time. <laughs>